Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Chasing Frets. And as you heard on Monday, I'm joined this week by my co-host Joe Gore. Hey, hi folks. And uh, and we have Molly Miller as our guest this week. It's Molly Miller week here at Chasing Frets. And um, selfishly, today's topic is about how she approaches her whole approach to playing in, in trio. And, and why is that selfish, Jason? Because I want to do it. I want to play in a trio. I want to get my trio chops together. And it's it's players like her and Julian Lodge. And, and even going back to you know Jim Hall, his famous Jim Hall Live record, that I've, I've been intimidated. I've been intimidated by playing in trio, and it's time that I just bite the bullet and get to it. Hey, we should since we're talking about trio, we should mention, because we neglected to do it in the interview that uh, one of her main projects is the Molly Miller trio where she, you know, plays along with a fabulous rhythm section of Jay Belarus and Jennifer Condos. And uh, they've got a new record coming out. Not just yet. I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be early in the new year, year, uh, but called St. George. So keep an eye peeled for St. George by the Molly Miller trio. Yeah. And in today's episode, she kind of breaks apart her approach and it, and thankfully, and no, I knew this before we talked, but it goes far past just the typical jazz standard fare. She even breaks out a Tom Waits tune and plays it, uh, plays it for us. Yeah, and that's now, pretty cool. That's gonna make me go back and check out that Tom Waits record and check out that tune. Um, but uh, but yeah, so today's episode, a lot of good nuts and bolts things to to talk about if you're like me and and want to get into playing more more trio type stuff so yeah yeah and she's 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 a very formidable solo guitar player and she she goes into you know what you play when you're playing solo might not work at all when you're playing in a trio and she's exactly. um she exactly. she plums those depths a little bit for us all right so thanks for joining us today and so we'll get right to it here's our conversation with molly miller all right molly i have to admit as i mentioned shortly uh well, time ago, uh, this is a selfish topic for me because one of my personal goals as a guitar player is to play more uh, trio gigs, and that's one format that I don't really have a lot of experience in. And it seems like I've there's a handful of guitar players I know that seem to really, really excel in it. And so today, I want to talk to you about how you approach arranging and composing and playing and improvising in the confines of a, a typical trio, say guitar, bass, drums, guitar, organ, drums, something like that. So when yeah. did you first kind of start to explore the trio format? You mentioned you have siblings that uh, that play, and I'm, I'm familiar with your brother, Sammy. Yeah. <clears throat> but what, do you, what instruments do your other siblings play? It's funny. My answer actually just shifted whilst you, you like gave me the real answer. I forgot. I was like, when did I start playing trio? <laughs> yeah, um, I'm one of five. I'm the middle. My oldest brother is a bass player, but he's smarter than my younger brother, Sammy, and I. He has a career outside of music. Mm. Then I, my older sister in the family band played sax and piano. I played guitar. Sammy's drummer. Your parents must have been musicians, huh? No, doctors. I, and then my little sister like did everything but nothing. We'd give her a guitar and unplug it. We'd give her <laughs> maracas and take all the beans out, you know? Uh. <laughs> No, my parents are doctors. It was really my dad's idea. I always said it was like, if you guys have seen the movie Selena, it's like my dad just like came home with instruments. He's like, and now you're in a band and you're playing guitar. And I was like, okay. (laughs) And here I am, you know, 20 whatever years later. So you guys had like a legit like guitar, bass drum, saxophone quartet. Yeah. Really. And I played trumpet too. My childhood trumpet that I got in third grade, I'm looking at it right now. I always have fantasies about learning, relearning trumpet. Um, Yeah. We like, that was my whole childhood. We had mandatory band practice for like an hour every day in a non-super Joe Jackson way. (laughs) Yay. (laughs) So relieved to hear that. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. We still all love each other. My little, yeah. Like you said, your oldest brother who is the bass player smartened up, decided not to be a professional musician. Sammy is, has a great band that you play in called Sammy Mill and the Congregation. Your other sister, is she a mus- professional musician in any way or just? Oh my God. No, my other two. So one of my sisters is a doctor and the other is a lawyer, but she did play in her uh, law school jazz band. She played sax. So no, everyone's, Sammy and I somehow decided to do this crazy thing called be a musician. But 
back to your original question, yes. trio playing. Um, yeah. So my sisters were kind of like, no, I don't want to do music. I want to like hang out with my friends and have a life and whatever. Um, not be broke my whole life, things like that. So they stopped playing music. And then my older brother and my younger brother and I, in, when I was in high school, the three of us would play together. So that really was the beginning of my trio playing. But then when I was at USC, what actually helped a lot was I would take, I took a couple of classes with Frank Potenza, who's a wonderful trio player and guitar player in general. He, uh, and solo guitar player. Um, but I took his trio class, but really I feel like when it all changed is when I had a steady gig at Perch in downtown uh, before quarantine, I had been doing it for like over five years, but and I, it's, it was a ton of trio playing. So I was like, I had to get a book together. So it happened pretty organically. It wasn't like, I'm going to start a trio. My friend who I played like a one casual gig with was like, um, he started booking at Perch. He's like, hey, would you want to do a trio gig every Monday and not worry about having to bring people out and just play? And I was like, yes. And I was like, oh my God, I have to learn a bunch of songs. Um, so that, and eventually it became quartet. Kenton sings like, Kenton Chen, he's awesome. He sings like half the set, but um, so that's where the trio existed. And I, and I love that format because of the freedom that you get. Um, I, I just fell in love with the format because I, I think I had so much, for so long, I think we're always told what we need to play or should play or have to learn. And suddenly I had this like open canvas and I got to explore all these songs I loved. And instead of just playing them alone in a room, I got to play them with people. So for me, I like fell in love with the the whole process of taking a song, whether it be like a Tom Waits song or like a Ronette song or a jazz standard and being like, okay, how am I going to play it with these players? And how what's my vision for it? And then that that grew pretty organically over a few years into Jennifer Condos, Jay Bellaros, and me having a trio where I, that's like all I would do, would do on my off time, like touring with Jason is if I'd be like in a hotel room practicing and like arranging songs, like what's our next song going to be? Cause it's, yeah, I love that form of expression. Is that your regular trio? Mm-hmm. Uh, they're really good. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're my great. like best friend. I miss them. Yeah. I got to play with Jen last week in real life, which was nice. But yeah, Jen, Jay and I are trying to figure out, how, we've been like, like recording stuff and sending it to each other, but we're trying to figure out how to, how to play more in this moment. It seems, so your book, it was kind of made up, like you said, of, of pop tunes, rock tunes, other tunes, and along with the jazz standard stuff, which to me that the, the, uh, the jazz standard songbook, that's kind of been codified through Jazz Academia, which we both have mustered through. Yeah. But I'm way more interested in how you approach, let's say, since Joe's here, a Tom Waits song. What Tom Waits song would appear in a Molly Miller trio set? Innocent When You Dream. Oh, that's, yeah. Yes. I, I, did, I didn't play on that record, but I got to play with him live a couple times. Oh, I'm jealous. I yes. Know, I can't believe it. Okay, so I'm on the spot, but yeah. So I can show you a little bit like of my arrangement. So if you don't know the song, go listen to it. It's like, it's sloppy and kind of drunk, but it's this beautiful song, right? On, Doesn't it feel like on, drunk? It's on swordfish trombones, right? I can't rem remember I what it's, it's on, on right now. Um, but there's like a looseness to it, but it is this beautiful, beautiful song. And it, so what I love to do is find a song, listen to the li lyrics and like, conceptualize like what is my feeling with it what is the character that I associate with this song and it's like this sweetness this longing um it's like to and so I would try to capture that so I want me to I can play you a little bit of of like how I play innocent when oh, you dream please. Mm -hmm. okay. it's like uh Yeah, so, so like you have, such, for, you have such a you have such a lovely touch on the instrument. Oh, thank you. But yeah, I love to like take a song and be like, like my version and Tom Waits is very different, 
And so I'm just trying to kind of convey how the song makes me feel and how, yeah, how it makes me feel. Does that kind of lead you to, I'm not super familiar with the original, but is it, uh, like you said, it's a sloppy drunk feel. So how that kind of emotional connection leads you to arranging as far as what kind of groove am I going to use on this? What kind of direction am I going to give Jennifer and Jay or... Yeah, like, okay, so like another example. So I play Mood Indigo. That's like one of the songs that's in the trio book. And, you know, Duke Ellington has his version. It's his song. It's an incredible song. He's got song. about 10 versions. Yeah, so Duke Ellington has his, like, but then what actually made me want to do it was I, I saw Nina Simone do it. And, like, you listen to the lyrics. Like, you ain't got this Mood Indigo. Like, oh, wait, you, like, you never have known anything until you've had this mood indigo. Like, you don't know what real sadness is until you, until you got this mood indigo. And she just, like, captures not only how, like, sad it is, but, like, kind of the, a little bit of, like, the anger. And, like, it's kind of, like, like, I'm pissed. Like, I, then that's, like, kind of how I was interpreting it. Like, it's not just this, like, sad, you, do, 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 no, no, no. But it's also like the frustration and upset and anger and like everything that's tied in to the sadness of like a relationship ending. Um, and so I wanted to like capture a little bit of like the the punch and the, and the frustration. So uh, like how I play the song, uh, one, two, three, hey. <laughs> And so like, that's like the groove that starts and then Jay comes in and it's like all fiery. It's like. on and on and there's like a whole breakdown section with just jay and i because that's i feel like i can get more chaotic like just like feeling and frustration and like you can kind of go crazy and which is everything that's tied into how i feel that about was the song. that was a trip what you just did because you know you kind of started with that sort of uh you know rock and rolly or uh you know peter gunnish sort of sort of vamp mm-hmm. but then you were so you so um even just in that little excerpt you, you were so digging into the Ellington harmonies and that little bit of a whole tone thing. And yeah, um, that was, that was fab. I'm biased because Ellington is, I think Ellington is America's greatest musician. Oh yeah. He's um, incredible. But um, wow, that was super, super cool. It was, I mean, cause it wasn't, it wasn't just the tune. You were like really, you were, you were, you know, really grappling with the, the very clever, and evocative harmonies he uses. And I'm also just imagining like hanging out at this, place you play on monday nights and you guys start playing that groove i'm like oh okay cool and then you start playing the melody and then all of a sudden i'm like that would like turn my head like wait what like <laughs> is this yeah right indigo? <laughs> like i i love i love and then we have like stops and breaks and you know even like it's supposed to like start all crazy and the melody comes in and they're sort of like a, like a, a different feel that comes with it where it's a little smoother because i think you know there's a journey within every song and within all the arranging that's what i'm trying to get to is like you know every, we all every experience every feeling there is there are multiple it's layered and i think trying to capture some of those layers and trying to figure out a way how to do that within the arrangement is always what i'm trying to do with the trio and the most fun part is when you know who's in your trio and you get to write for them that was the ellington secret yeah you know he knew how to he knew how to write for his his team yeah mm-hmm. um uh, a, a more nuts and bolts trio question. Yeah. Um, how do you change? How do you change, if at all, your approach to the guitar's lower register when you're when you're working with the rhythm section? Because mm. hearing your hearing your solo stuff, you're not doing you're not like doing the Charlie Hunter, Ted Green, like I sound like a bass and a guitar at the same time. Yeah. But you're not you're not just like hitting drones down there. I mean, you you have like moving you know melodies and counterpoint, maybe in more of a Joe Pass sense. Um, but th- that always, there's always something really defined in the, in your, in your low register. And do you, does that go by the wayside when you're playing with bass and drums? Like solo playing versus like when my solo yeah, playing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, you know, I am always aware of my range. I don't necessarily avoid the low end 
because I think maybe I'll like change it and go on the back pickup and maybe like we'll play like a country song, you know, and like if I'm like, you know, like doing I'm so lonesome, I could cry. And during the solo, maybe I will be like. And like do some of that kind of lower stuff. But, you know, if I was a guitar player and someone start, starts playing in my area, I don't like it. So I, I, I am conscious of it, though. And because um, like you, you would mention the counterpoint stuff. I love what I love creating bass lines. But if there's a bass player, I'm in staying out of their their range, but I don't avoid the low area unless for soloing. But for chords, yes. You know, for Mel, I'd say like, I'd, I, I'm aware of like, because it will get really muddy if you're playing like too much chords, like six six note chords or, or, or chords down below if there's a bass player. I think just being aware of the range and not wanting to get muddy. And also, you know, we, uh, uh, Jason and Molly and I are on video and you, dear listener, are not. <laughs> but um, I'm, I'm watching Molly play right now, and is that always your technique? You know, she's she's playing she's playing with the flat pick, um, you know, between her thumb and index finger, but using her other fingers a lot. And uh, you, it looks like your wrist is a little bit curved, so your your palm is towards the bridge as opposed to, you know, arch, arched out from the bridge. Is that is that kind of your default? Yeah. method or is that something that changes up a lot from from song to song hybrid picking i am like i could be a sales rep for hybrid picking <laughs> yeah because it's like you sell us sell us yeah well like you get every texture that way you know sometimes when i want to play fast lines i can i can get my pick and i know how to get like you can get a little bit of the thump and then the beauty of the fingers and also there's a different sort of uh tone and touch and not yeah. There's a different fluidity you get with your fingers. You have I think everything's at your. It's like going to a buffet with your right hand. You can have anything you want. <laughs> yeah, I am a I am a pretty big uh, hybrid picking devotee. Just because that's when I started playing, I was like, well, why would I not? Once I kind of got the basic alternate picking together, you know, because I think you kind of have to get a little bit of that together if you want to do hybrid picking, and then just add the fingers on. And I was like, I'm just gonna play like this until it feels good. Yeah. Uh, I, it, I'm going to give the devil's advocate argument, though it's really weak when you listen to Molly play, play in that style. But um, I'm, I'm a no pick person. And my, my counter argument would be, you know, with the pick, you lose the expressive possibilities of the thumb and index finger. You can't use them like you can your fingers. Um, yeah. I, I feel like I've spent so much time with it I'm so sold on this that like <laughs> uh, there's no way. Well, I mean the only the evidence the evidence is your music and obviously obviously your technique is great because your 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 playing is great. Thanks. When you when you come up with an idea for a song and like you said you're connecting to the emotional what it makes you feel. Mm -hmm. What's how do you present that to your trio? Do you write out a, a legit chart? Do you just talk it through in a rehearsal? Is there a combination of both or Both. Yeah, I, I like to write okay. charts because well, normally I'm, my trio is Jen and Jay. It's not always that. I, I'm very fortunate. I know a lot of fabulous musicians. Like maybe it's my brother, Sammy, and a bassist that we both play with a bunch, like Corbin Jones or the, the fabulous David Pilch. I get to play with him a bunch. So there's like our different musicians that come in, in the circle. So I do write charts. Just, um, yeah, I'm like, I'm like, while I tour and do all that, like I have like my iPad I bring out with my Molly Miller charts, you know? So, I'll, but um. All, normally how it goes with Jay and Jen is I have a chart and Jen doesn't really look at it and I we just talk about the song and I'd be like and then Jay will be like you know what this reminds me of and it is always his references are so deep uh, and he and I feel like the cool thing about it is I start playing and they just get what I want mm -hmm. I don't even necessarily have to say it. like I wrote an original tune recently that was because so Jay would play with us at perch sometimes. Normally the drummer's this guy, Steve Haas, who's awesome. Um, but when Jay would sub, we would play songs that Ken and Kenton would sing like Beyonce and like Ariana Grande and like these like with like hip hop beats. And the way he plays hip hop is insane. It's like the deepest, like 
they are so heavy. Uh, like, and I'm like playing Beyonce with Jay Bellarose, you know, it's like so silly, but I was like, I want to play a song where you play like that. Um, and so I did. So I'd be like, Jay, I want you to do the, the thing you do on that Beyonce song on this original, like this original instrumental. So sometimes it'll be like that, but typically it's just like, I'll start playing and they'll play a groove and we'll like, while I have an arrangement, sometimes we'll stay true to my arrangement, but oftentimes it is a, a work in progress together where we sort out, um, you know, how, how we're all going to, how we're going to orchestrate that's so it. That's cool. Okay. That's official. I need to get, I need to get my book together, Molly. Then we can, then we can trade charts. Yes. And <laughs> let's trade charts. I mean, like the fun thing is like, yeah, sometimes like Jen will send me a song or my sister or my mom, someone will be like, oh, you should play this song. Or it's just like, and I love like the song, like, oh yeah, we did like a little country thing. We have a thing where we'll do, um, good girl's going to go bad, Tammy Wynette and, um, King of the road. And we play those back to back. And it's like, yeah, but they're all over the place and they're so fun. But I feel like when you hear us, like they all, it all works. It sounds like that's the band. Oh, it, they all make sense so together. Cool. What, what, what tool, what, what tools do you use on, on your iPad to, um, what are you writing in? Oh no, I write charts in Sibelius and then I'll just create PDFs and put it in. I use, yeah. oh, okay. yeah. Right. Well, Molly, this has been such an enlightening episode for me. I'm, uh, I'm feeling, I'm feeling so inspired to me be like, too. I'm just like looking at the posters on my wall. Like what, whose tune could I take and start a uh, Reddit chart on? Well, well, I mean, you know, and the, you know, and the, the, the good news is, um, Molly's a major teacher, you know, <laughs> the way she's inspiring you and me, mm. you know, in this conversation she's doing to lots of other, other students. Are, do you still have, are you still the guitar chair at LA College of Music? I am. Yeah. So I still am doing a lot of teaching and then, uh, playing yeah yesterday it was funny when you were saying like oh what should i do yesterday for i started playing uh i fought the law like as like a guitar arrangement like everything works and that's the thing that's so fun is like could this song possibly work i did an stp song with sammy the other day it was like they're kind of all over the place or like a jazz tune and it's just fun to see like how and that i think forces you to make it your own even more when it's not just like all the things you are it really is like how can this be my song um, but yeah, I'm still teaching a lot and uh, playing a lot of guitar. It's just all vir mostly virtual. It'll return one day. We will have live music soon. It will. Oh my God, I'm going to hug everyone I see, unless they don't want me <laughs> to hug them, but yes. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much, Molly, for hanging and talking. And Thank you. Uh, totally inspired. And we'll, uh, we'll see you back here on Friday. Woohoo!